Hey, welcome to the Relentless Positivity Podcast. I'm your host, Joe Martin. And my guest today, he's got a life story that kind of it reads like an epic novel, to be honest with you. There's highs and lows, there's twists and turns, achievements and heartbreak. And, and I truly think his story is going to help someone today. He said he gets inspired by hearing other people's story and he gets a chance to give back today. So Bridger, thanks for coming on, man. Appreciate you being here. Yeah, I appreciate you having me. I appreciate the the intro and I'm excited to be here. Yeah, yeah, you guys buckle up, man. There's a, it's a heck of a ride he's been on. So uh, take us back to the beginning. How come, why did you decide to drop out of school? Okay, so very beginning is I always, um, I lived on a little farm in, Mon not really a farm, but a rural property in Montana when I was a child and had open space, horses, and my idols at the time were Steve Irwin, Jeff Corwin. I just wanted to catch wild animals, be outside and adventure. Um, and we moved to the suburbs when I was about six years old after I had an injury um, that made my parents want to be closer to family. And I felt just suffocated and trapped by suburbia. I just, it was, it felt like a, a prison to me. And I just, it was weird and I just wanted to escape for as long as I can remember. Um, and eventually I just kind of didn't see my path ever being aligned with what I was learning in school. I didn't understand why I was there. I found school um, easy, not because I was exceptionally smart. I was just good at taking standardized tests when there was only four potential answers. And that was kind of what the whole thing was geared towards. And it just, um, yeah, it felt really pointless. And I always just wanted to escape. I found out that you could get into university with a GED and um, called the school and told them I was never coming back that day. And it was, I mean, even now when I talk about it, I remember it with just, it was such just a flood of relief that I wasn't gonna have to spend you know, another two years in, in high school at the time. Yeah. I had plenty of friends like that. Just school is not the thing for a lot of people and you got to do it, man, but I'm glad you found an another path. So, so you get to, you get to university and then you end up dropping out of there as well. What, what led to that decision? So I was going to school for business and I went for a couple of, couple of years and just kind of realized that, um, I should just start a business rather than be in school for business. Um, and there were an opportunity came up to start a small sub subcontracting construction company that was going to operate out of Washington, Idaho, California. And I just jumped on the opportunity. I thought I would learn a lot more being in business rather than reading about it and talking about it. There you go. So what, what, what led you to construction? Was just something that you came across, you were interested in? Well, why construction? So to be honest, I mean, I did labor and agricultural work my whole life. My fam, I have family members in construction. My dad's a horseshoer. My mom's a lunch lady. And until I was in my early 20s, I didn't really know that there was an alternative to trading your time for you know, a set dollar amount per hour. Uh, I loved physical labor. I loved manual labor. I liked building things. I couldn't be inside. I couldn't be, um, you know, I didn't ever see myself in an office type position. And so, yeah, it just was a, felt like a good opportunity and it was something that I enjoyed. Yeah. So you, you worked a little construction. You had a, a stint in the drug dealing world. How, how does that compare to the construction world? Are there any similarities or what's the deal with so, those? So my days selling drugs was in high school. I, I basically moved out of my parents' house when I was about 14 years old, not full time. I'd go stay there sometimes, but I lived with a friend of mine and I just was selling drugs because I liked doing drugs, to be honest. I, from the first time I ever drank or smoked weed, I just absolutely loved it. I felt like I was born to do it. Um, I loved exploring alternative mental states and 
it eventually it took a negative turn where it was an escapism and it got really dark. But at first it was really beautiful, if I'm being honest, and just something that I loved. And I just thought I was going to be in that world forever and I was going to do that forever. Um, but it didn't take long. I got into some, it was during, I 31 now and it was like in the 2000 or the late 2010s and my friends and I all got into Oxycontin and yeah it everything took a pretty dark turn pretty quickly there basically became a drug addict within three months of trying it for the first time and just after about you know eight months of really heavy use of that I saw the writing on the wall and decided to just extricate myself from that world for the most part. Um, still dabbled in things, but it just, I didn't see that. I, all I saw as far as scaling that business led to, to violence and possible incarceration. So. Yeah. Oh, man, well, glad you made the right decision. So, because it, it tends to, just knowing a little bit about your life story, you tend to be all in on whatever you're doing. So if you kept on that path, I'm sure you'd have tried to be shoot to the top. And like you said, that that's a path to nowhere. So uh, speaking of you kind of being wide open, so you got $2,000 in your pocket and you said, you know what I'm going to do? I'm going to move to Australia. So tell me a little bit about that and how you came to that decision. So I was dry. I was basically working 12 to 17 hours a day, uh, running this construction company in California, seven days a week. Um, and much like the drug dealing business was imagining how I was going to scale this, where it was going to go. Um, and I actually, I, a serendipitous moment, I got caught in this like six hour traffic jam um, coming out of Sacramento going south. And I was sitting in traffic and I just had, I don't want to oversell it, but it was almost like an out of body experience. I was like, not happy for sure. And I was realizing like, if I'm going to really grow this, I'm going to have to take on loans. I'm going to have to take on debt. I'm going to have to take on things that I can't get out of. I'm going to be, you know, committed to this for a long time. And I just started thinking about, I imagined I embodied my 80 year old self. I tried to feel what it'd be like to be laying on my deathbed and be looking back in time and tried to envision what that person would want for me and what choice they would make. And I just instantly was like, I mean, I definitely wouldn't be doing construction for 12 to 17 hours a day. I'm not going to remember this. I'm not going to be proud of this. Um, and I just knew instantly that I needed to, before I took on all this responsibility, I needed to have my adventure. I was 21 at the time and maybe I was 20. I guess I was 20 at the time, um, almost 21, a couple months before my 21st birthday. And I got the hotel. I bought myself and one of my really close friends at the time. I called him and said, Hey, if I buy you a ticket, a plane ticket to Australia, will you come with me? And he said, yes. So I bought us both plane tickets to Australia, um, finished out the job that I was currently working on the project, um, had about a week left on a project down in California, quit my job, went back up to Idaho and basically spent all the money I saved over the course of a couple months leading up to leaving for Australia. And by the time we actually got on the flight between the two of us, we had about two grand, had to lie to customs to get into Australia because you're supposed to have at least five grand in your account. And, um, there we were on our our grand adventure, and it turned out to be uh, uh, exactly that. We hitchhiked from um, well, we we got a rented some sort of RV thing and drove up to Brisbane, and then hi hitchhiked from Brisbane up to Cairns, Australia, and it was just. Um, it was the happiest I'd ever been in my entire life. I'd always wanted to travel, always wanted to go on an adventure. I felt like I was finally living my purpose. I was finally living in alignment with what I was meant to be doing. Oh, wow. So how did you guys make a living, you know, find food, shelter, all that good stuff? What'd you guys do? We 
had we stayed at hostels and stuff for the first couple of days and then after we got we basically left sydney and went if sydney was just too expensive went to brisbane and we're like this money is not going to sustain us uh living in in comfort so we just camped we camped and stayed with people that we hitchhiked with and um we're living basically in the jungle in Cairns when there was a massive like three-day rainstorm and we're in a tent it was like an inch deep in water both of us were miserable mosquitoes bugs of every description everywhere and we were like we have to we have to find shelter that isn't this tent and basically we ended up um going to a bunch of hostels and just one of them said yeah you can live and work here if you clean the rooms for a couple hours a day and we jumped on that opportunity immediately then we got a job selling pub crawl tickets to other tourists and yeah basically did that until my my visa ran out to australia at which point um booked a flight to Indonesia and spent a month there trying to finagle my way back into Australia. Wow. Oh man. So you, you end up taking this Australian adventure into just a world, almost a worldwide adventure. So I want to jump over to you, you go on a solo bicycling tour through Africa, the African wilderness. Tell, tell me about that. It sounds awesome and terrifying at the same time. Yeah. So with with that, that was, I had lived in Australia for um, basically 18 months at that point and then moved to New Zealand for a year. And a friend of mine that I met along the way, we decided we're going to go cycle through Africa. We just wanted the, a real, you know, a real, real adventure at this point. Um, and he ended up flying back to Wales a couple weeks before the trip and got stuck there for some reason. I already had tickets, already had all the gear, the bikes, everything. And so I ended up flying to South Africa alone and basically just assembled my bike out in front of the airport and started riding. Um, no, I, I mean, I just, I didn't even have a direction I was planning on going. I asked around, people said, definitely don't ride your bike through Johannesburg. Mm -hmm. um, they just said it was very dangerous. They said that the West Coast was going to be cold that time of year. And so I headed up the the East Coast of Africa. And it was, I had, I mean, I didn't know whether there was wildlife I needed to be worried about, whether it was, I, I didn't know anything, to be honest. And um the next thing I know, I was just cycling alone, camping every night in in the African wilderness. And it was the hardest thing I've ever done. It was the best thing I've ever done. I mean, it was just the greatest experience. The most notable part is everywhere I went, everyone told me, I can't believe that you just rode your bike through there. Those people are dangerous. That's the dangerous place. And the next place you're going is dangerous. And that was just a reoccurring event everywhere I went, but everyone was just fantastic. And um, even, you know, in villages where everyone was living in abject poverty, you know, open latrines, absolutely nothing. The people there were just so much happier than, you know, in the West for the most part. Everyone seemed a lot happier and that was made a huge impression on me when i was in places where people were living in poverty i didn't even know existed before but it, because they had community they had people they had purpose they were surviving they just seemed so much more filled with life and joy and honestly with so much less stress than we have than you know the typical well off american person has Wow. Man, I think you nailed it because I think there's so many people that don't have community nowadays. We all, you know, you go to work, maybe you work with some people, then you come home and 
you know, in my neighborhood, people go into their houses and they pretty much stay there because they got everything they need, right? And in communities like that, you got to work together. You got to depend on your neighbors. Here, I, I don't even know some of my neighbors, right? So I think that's a huge difference yeah. and, and why people are so much happier. That's how we're meant to live. I think that's cool you got to experience that. And I've, I've seen the same. I've gone to Nicaragua a few times and, and I'm playing with the kids. These kids have absolutely nothing, you know, and they are the happiest kids rather than the kid that's got the PlayStation 5 and the Xbox and all these things, and they're still sad because they got friends. They got people to play with, and they don't need, you don't need toys if you've got your imagination as a kid. I mean, you were out there by yourself as a kid, right, looking for animals and doing all things, just as happy as you could be. So, man, that's a that's a really awesome experience, and, and kind of a note we all need to make for ourselves that, hey, I think we're doing it. I think we got things backwards. Yeah, I mean, it's the hardest thing. I've, I've, I struggle so much. I've moved to Florida a couple years ago and even in Idaho where I'm from where I was living before I've just struggled so much to find community to find a group of like-minded people that you know really wants to pursue a similar life path that I want to, to pursue that isn't just wanting to kind of pass the time yeah it's it, it's tough finding community I think it's the hardest thing in the world right now, especially in, you know, in America and the Western world in general. And that's my biggest dream is just to be surrounded by like-minded people, by a bunch of guys who have drive to, to make stuff happen in the world, because it, it's tough. It's really tough. Absolutely, man. You, you definitely got to drive to make things happen because you're, you're over there, you're riding through Africa by yourself in the wilderness and everyone probably didn't mess you there. That's like, this dude's probably crazy. You probably shouldn't mess with it. That's probably why you didn't have any trouble. So, uh, so you get this idea, I'm going to come back and I want to be a, a cattle mogul. So first of all, where does that idea come from? And, and what did you learn from kind of that experience where you're trying to become one? So the guy that flew to Australia with me, he's a third generation, uh, cattle family. And he had started a cattle company in the interim while I was living overseas. He'd started a quite successful cattle company. I came back, moved to a mountain town, was doing construction and working on a ski mountain, mountain, driving like snow cats and plowing snow. And I was working like sometimes, I mean, honestly, like 23 hours a day, I would do construction landscaping all day, drive snow cats all night. And I was just financially getting crushed. I mean, I just couldn't keep up. And I was working as much as a human being could, was relatively a valuable employee. You know, I wasn't getting paid nothing. I was getting paid well doing construction, getting paid pretty good uh, driving these snow cats. And I just couldn't believe how hard it was to to make a real life for yourself and my dream has always been to buy a wilderness property and build basically like a health retreat and I didn't see any possibility of that happening on the path that I was on unless it was 10 20 years down the road but I knew that if I learned how to raise cattle, I could at least make a large piece of property viable. I could at least pay for it. Um, and so ended up working with my buddy and had, we had really different visions of what we wanted to do long-term. I wanted to do grass-fed regenerative agriculture and he's just in the cattle industry, which is industrial. And I eventually just lost sight of everything outside of the, the end goal. I just wanted to be wealthy at all costs and really went down, you know, quite a dark path. I don't want to paint the cattle industry in a bad light because it's a product of our consumerism, but it's a brutal industry. I mean, we were basically facilitating the death of, you know, somewhere between like 50 and a hundred thousand cows a year. And you just see a lot of brutality, a lot of suffering, a lot of really disgusting meat going into the, the food supply and the whole thing, the industrial, we were on the industrial side of it. We were middlemen buying and selling 
cattle, like brokering cattle from feedlots and dairies to the slaughterhouses. So we weren't raising cattle, at least not at scale. And so, yeah, it just, it was, uh, it was a dark industry to be a part of. And I was a hundred percent convinced that I was going to do it until I had hundreds of millions, if not uh, billions of dollars. I There was nothing in my heart that ever could have stopped me or strayed me from that path, except for I flipped my truck through a telephone pole going 85 miles per hour and had a terrible spinal cord injury, nearly died. And I mean, when I tell you immediately, the mo- I wasn't knocked unconscious or anything. I was fully lucid for the experience. And like wow. right when it happened, laying in the truck, I thought I got cut in half or something because I couldn't feel the bottom half of my body. I was folded up in a weird position. And the moment it happened, I was like, this is enough to stop me. Like this is the only thing that could have changed my path back to the path that I'd wanted to be on for my whole life, which was pursuing creativity, making the world a better place, helping people heal, and having a a property to do all that. I that that was the end goal. But I was so far removed from it at that point. This is the only thing that could have brought me back there. Wow. I can't believe you're conscious to the whole thing, man. That had to be awful. It was incredibly painful. Um surprisingly not as i wasn't as shocked as i would have thought i had been um i was my girlfriend was in the vehicle with me she was laying down and she had her seatbelt on i didn't have a seatbelt on but she was knocked unconscious she basically so we were driving down the road and someone turned the opposite direction in front of us at the last second the sun was sitting behind me and they couldn't couldn't see us and they hit the front of them, flipped through the telephone pole. My back was up against the ceiling as we went through the telephone pole with the roof. And she basically hit her face on this telephone pole going 80, 85 miles per hour. So she's knocked unconscious. She's gurgling. And I think I'm this injured. She's certainly going to die or is, is actively dying. So in the moment was so concerned about her i didn't i i felt like i i didn't know whether or not i was going to die but having her there kind of transcended the experience a little bit um but i think people would be you know surprised at how calm you are when it's when you're so messed up there's so much adrenaline and whatever endorphins shooting through your body that you can be quite um yeah, lucid and, and calm just because of the chemical factory that's happening inside you, I suppose. I don't have any other explanation for it. Wow, man. Uh, how is she to now, nowadays? Now, so she um, broke her neck and no spinal cord injury involvement, thank God. Um, pretty serious head injury, but no, you know, immediate long-lasting effects from it, like, you know, no trouble walking or slurred speech or anything like that. She was relatively, you know, okay. And she's doing awesome now. She's somewhere around here walking her dogs. Awesome. Awesome. Glad to hear it, man. So uh, what was it, what was it like for your rehab mentally and physically? What was, uh, what was the hardest part for you? So the, I was in a rehab hospital for three months and it was, uh, the first three weeks were actually kind of all right. I was pretty ha- happy and fine. Um, I was so grateful not to have a head injury or be a quadriplegic or and to be alive in general. I was surrounded by family and friends, and it was um, it was pretty easy for the first couple of weeks. You know, there was a ton of moments. It's just a series of moments and realizations of, you know, what you're about to face that was the hardest part. Um, Just the first time I tried, you know, had to be sat up in bed and 
I just, all my blood pressure just sucked out of me. I went ghost pale, covered in sweat and basically collapsed back onto the bed and, you know, realized how it wasn't just having to deal with not being able to walk. You know, I had, my whole body was basically crushed and I started to realize just how serious it was. So, I mean, all of the hardest parts though were definitely after I got released from the hospital and was trying to uh, adapt to life. And it was kind of like, I couldn't imagine things getting worse. I thought I was at the deepest pit of hell that a human being can get to and was continually shocked at how much deeper that could go over the course of most probably the first two years. It was kind of like, you know, definitely I was always fighting upwards and it felt like I was moving upwards, but looking back on it, I realized that it was, you know, almost progressively harder for the first couple of, of years, just coming to terms with everything, um, learning to live with just constant, tremendous amounts of pain and be able to be happy inside of that. It was just, it was, it was a battle. It was the, you know, by and far the hardest thing I'd ever done in my life. And I pursued hard things aggressively. I looked for difficult things to do my entire life. And it was, you know, a hundred times harder than I ever could have imagined life could be. I remember there was one period of time when I was living in this apartment in Denver, Colorado is where uh, Colorado was where I actually had the accident. I was living in Denver, Colorado. And there was a couple week period where I would just sit on the toilet. So my girlfriend couldn't see me. I would just cry, just desperately cry, not just for my own suffering, but just because I, I didn't realize that suffering of that magnitude was even humanly possible. And I was like, there's, and it broke my heart thinking like, there's people out there that have been feeling this way my whole life. And I've just been going through my life, feeling awesome, being healthy, um, having everything at my disposal. Uh, what didn't seem like everything at the time, but now with so many barriers to just existing, it felt like just everything at my disposal and just having no idea that there was pain being felt of you know, this order of, of magic, I didn't know it was possible. And it, it broke my heart just knowing how much I was suffering and that there was just people feeling this every single day. I couldn't believe there was this much suffering possible without dying. Man, that's a huge realization right there that I hadn't thought about that either. So, man, that's something that we could all learn from. Hey, you never know how good you have it till it's gone. Right. So uh, what was your secret to kind of, internalizing that and realizing that's going on and still, you know, having this positive outlook on life and going forward, trying to help people. Just nothing but a tremendous amount of work. So many dark times, so much time spent feeling sorry for myself, spent so much time wasted, not taking action and just eventually getting to a point where you realize in, in not in, not in a negative way, but no one cares. It's no one, people that love you, they do care, but only up to a certain point can they put your suffering into their life or make your problems their problem. There's just a, a limit, no matter what you're going through, that you can offload that onto anyone around you. And I just eventually realized that there's no other way but forward. And I kind of intuitively knew that, but just it was through a series of breaking points where I realized it more and more that you just have to take action. No matter how small the action is, it's just, a, and I, it's not that I don't still get down. I still have times um, where it, it just seems impossible to even get out of bed, to to do the next thing. I'm just shortening the period of time that it takes me to take that action. So whereas before it might've been three weeks of being depressed and overwhelmed by pain 
and health problems and financial problems and everything. And then I was able to, you know, break out of that funk in two weeks and then one week. And now I'm trying to get it down to where, you know, I only fall from grace um, for a few minutes or for a few seconds. And I, it's, I think the first step is just recognizing when it's happening and, you know, really, really being aware of your thoughts and how they affect your world. And when you're thinking negatively, when you're getting angry, when you're feeling hopeless, just not running with that emotion and just arresting it as quickly as possible. And like I said, it could take a week at first, or it could take a month, it could take three months to take that first action towards health again. So it's a, it's an ongoing thing being positive and being able to keep the end goals in mind. It's just, it's, it's, you know, it's the hardest thing in the world. And so Absolutely. it's an ongoing, ongoing process. Man. Yeah. Kudos to you for hanging in there. There's a lot of people that, that make a different choice on that. So uh, you've mentioned a couple of times, you, you do still have this big goal that where you want to help people and have this. Tell us a little bit more about your big goal and how you plan on reaching it. So my overriding goal with lots of goals inside of it are, is to buy a wilderness property and basically build a healing place that myself and people can come to, to disconnect from the world, have access to all sorts of kind of fringe healing modalities, you know, red light saunas, cold baths, um, red light therapy, ox hyperbaric oxygen chamber, just a full spectrum healing place because, and then also access to, to wilderness and healthy food and wild food and food grown on the property that's always kind of been a desire of mine and i've just strayed from the path so many times that now i'm just dead set on that and figuring out figuring out how to get there as soon as possible i have a couple of books that i'm in the process of publishing and i work currently for the last couple months as an insurance agent, I invest in crypto and am basically looking for a, a property actively. I just was reviewing a, a property a friend of mine sent me in British Columbia, probably not going to go to Canada, probably going to go somewhere in Montana or Idaho, but actively looking for a property to just start and start small, create a little Airbnb uh, situation and eventually build it into this full body, full human health retreat. That's the, that's the long-term goal for sure. Man, that sounds amazing right there. I'd love to go on a tree like that. Who wouldn't want to take it? You have community, healing your body, mind and soul together in one little place. That's pretty awesome right there. So uh, maybe there's someone out here listening to this that they feel mentally and physically and emotionally lost, like, like you've probably been through maybe even in the past week. Uh, what would you say to that person who's thinking about giving up? Just to take that first step, do something. It doesn't, don't waste time on, on what you can't do. That's the, that's the worst thing. Don't think about what you don't have, what you can't do, what's wrong. Just think about what in this exact moment can I do to just get one one hundredth of a percent better. Um, and Sometimes that first step is almost impossible to take. You just want to turn on another Netflix series, pick up another pill, take another drink. Um, you want to, it, it's impossible. It, it, it feels impossible to take that first step. Um, you know, obviously depending on what, you know, how, if you can't take that first step, tell somebody which is my biggest weakness. I have so much trouble being vulnerable to, to someone else and asking for help 
But it, if you can't take that first step, you just have to, you have to ask for help. You got to reach out to someone. I spent, you know, a year of maybe 18 months, kind of in a, a, a few months after I got paralyzed, I had a, you know, I had a 40 caliber pistol accessible to me at all times. And it was like a siren song calling my name, not even be, I did and I would never myself um, commit suicide because I couldn't do that to the people I love. But personally, on a personal level, I just wanted to escape, not even because I didn't see hope in the future. I just was in so much pain and I couldn't escape from it. I just wanted a relief from the suffering. Um, but it's, it's, it's the ultimate, uh, sin, if you will. The one thing that we all have in common is we've been given the most beautiful gift in the world. And there's something on the other side of the suffering, all suffering and pain, all ex human experience in, in life is experiencing an equilibrium for however much suffering you have. That's now how much joy you're allowed to have later. So I've never been able to experience the joy I can now experience because I know the opposite end of the spectrum. It's you, it, it's equal. You're able to experience happiness and joy only equal to the amount of suffering that you've experienced. So I would say to that person, just keep going forward. There's another, there's, you will break through and you will get to the other side and it's going to be more beautiful than it ever was before, no matter what you have going on. Man, that's, that's a great message. And someone needed to hear that. I guarantee you someone out there listening right now needed that exact message. Thank you for sharing that. So uh, how do people connect with you and keep up with everything you have going on? So the best way is through Instagram at Bridger Lee Frederick. I also, if you have spinal cord injury, if you're interested in spinal cord injury related stuff, I have a YouTube channel, uh, also Bridger Frederick, Spinal Cord Injury Healing. Uh, it's kind of just getting started and I haven't uh, actively posted on there because I had some some health concerns myself, but I will be making a lot more spinal cord injury related content there. Um, and I will have a pre-order, uh, it depends when this, book or sorry, this podcast is released. I'll have a pre-order for a fiction book I'm writing, The Black House, probably available in the next probably six to eight weeks. Um, but that'll all be on my Instagram. I'll, I'll, I'll post about it. There's so a Bridger Lee Frederick is definitely the best way to reach me or check anything out. Okay, cool. I'll link those in show notes. If people go check those out. Just click the link, go right to that. And if you're listening right now, please share this episode with somebody. Uh, they need to know that they still matter, that they're valuable, and they have a special purpose in their life. And there's there's purpose on the other end of that pain that they're going through. That's what Bridger's biggest message was today for me was, hey, man, just keep going. There's there's something on the other side that's worth it. So, uh, And another great takeaway, uh, imagine yourself in your 80s what you're doing right now, when you look back, are you going to be proud of that moment? Is that something that excites you? Maybe you need to go on a great adventure. He's been on several of them. He could tell you this. I mean, I had to cut this thing shorter just to get it here in time. So uh, please keep up with Bridger, everything he has going on, man. I'd love to spread the word about your, your healing retreat. You're going to have one day. I can, I can picture it right now. I know you can picture it in your head. So, so thanks for being here, Bridger. I really appreciate you sharing today. Yeah. Thanks so much for having me. I absolutely uh, love your message and what you're doing. And I, I think it's really important. I think that there's kind of a, a, a battle of good and evil, if you will, happening in the world. And the more positivity and podcasts and shows and things like this out there, um, the better. That's it. And you just brought that message out to more people. So appreciate that. Hey, and, and appreciate you guys listening. And we will see you next week on the Relentless Positivity Podcast. Wow, what a great episode. You share that with somebody. I'm going to share with you some awesome sponsors. 
McWilliams Marketing. They can help your business grow. Regardless of the size of the project, you're going to get a solution that is specifically created for you and your business. No cookie cutter, one size fits approach here. So Amy and her band of fearless marketers can help you with all that stuff that you think you can do, but you're not really that good at it. You don't have time for it. They can do that. They're the experts. It's what they do. Web design, online conversion optimization, SEO, uh, graphic design, marketing, page management, all that stuff. Go let them do that. Don't handle that yourself. Go check them out at mcwilliamsmarketing.com. See what all they can do. They're amazing people. Tick Patnick with Patnick Realty. He really does it all in the real estate world. General real estate sales, acquisitions, property management, investments, all that good stuff. You're not just a transaction with Teak. He really wants to build a relationship for life with you. He has built his whole business on prayer, hard work ethic, honesty, and results. You can trust Patnick Realty with all your real estate needs. Hey, I trust my brother from another mother, Teak, and you should too. Give him a call, 256-694-0117, or email him at teak at patnickco.com. Hey, these are awesome businesses. Go support them. They're out supporting positivity, and they will do you right. Have an awesome day.